expecting in sunny Cornwall. I could a bit too wet at the time. But no, it's lovely to be here and thanks for the invite. So, um, just, I'll just give a little bit more background to myself because I'm, I spent a long time in this industry and really enjoyed it. Um, but um, last year I was with EGF Energy. Um, in fact, my final role was director of sustainable development. Um, but then I found a real change and a real challenge. And um, went out of college and started my PhD. Uh, I have to say that um, I know I knew nothing about heating, um, but my supervisor suggested this. And uh, when my supervisor suggests something, what he's really saying is, I think this would be a really good idea if you did it. So um, I picked it up, um, really wasn't sure about it, um, but became totally absor absorbed and obsessed with it, shall we say. I think you need to if you're doing something like a PhD. Um, and what I really enjoy about it is, is the strong technical component of it. My background is engineering. There's a strong economic component of, uh, of it. There's also a really important human behaviour element um, to the whole issue about decarbonising heat. Because at the end of the day, it's down to individuals making decisions about what sort of heating system they want to have in their homes. Um, and so I find that very interesting as well. Um, so, this is a list of topics I'm going to be covering. Um, I'm going to give some background to the challenges in decarbonising heat. Um, and you know, where we came from, where we are today. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about Denmark, because Denmark, as some of you may know, um, took a very different direction in the 70s. We went down the gas route, they went down the digital heating route. And there's some really interesting lessons to learn from their experience. I'm going to talk about the UK's carbon plan very briefly. Um, to show you know, what the, what the uh, thinking is, shall we say, behind, behind the UK's carbon plan and how heating fits into that. I'm then going to talk about DEX 2050 pathways analysis, just touch upon that. Um, and then I'm going to get some, just into some more technical stuff about the work I've been doing on modelling heat, um, heat economics, uh, and finishing off some conclusions. Um, but anyway, I'd be interested to know your sort of backgrounds, you know, who comes from a science discipline or engineering discipline or something else? Engineers? No? <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> science? I'm engineering. Sorry? Engineering. Engineering? Oh, okay. What's an engineer? Power and electrical. Great! <laughs> I'm a power engineer as well. Um, uh, what about other areas then? What's your background? Um, Come audience participation. <laughs> uh, I'm geography. Right. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, social science. Social science. science. Great. So, um, and I almost see all those topics um, feeding into this, this area. You know, I've talked about human behaviour. Uh, geography, I've touched upon um, why that has an important contribution to heat as well. Um, but I've got a question which I'm going to be asking you to think about as I run through this presentation, and which I'll ask for your ideas when we get to the end, um, which is, so what do we need to do well to decarbonise space and water heating in the UK? So a very broad question, but you know, so if you could just think about one thing that you think we, should, we need to do well, we've got to be really good at if we're going to decarbonise space and water heating. Um, and then I'll get your answers at the end of my presentation. And hopefully, I'll give you some ideas. So, um, so where do we come from? Um, so I'm going back to just after the Second World War. Um, and this is the UK's energy consumption from 1948 to 2008. And you can see the blue represents coal, so we're predominantly a coal-based energy economy. Um, I guess you won't be surprised to hear that. We had some gas, it was called town gas, um, and so the local town had its own gas works, um, and, and gas was produced from coal, and most of that was used for cooking and, and some heating, little gas fires. Um, and obviously electricity, um, and then you can see that over the, the, the 60 odd years from 1948, coal consumption reduced very significantly, petroleum increased, 
and the real big transformation occurred in, in the 70s with the red bar showing natural gas. So natural gas became available with the North Sea oil fines in the 60s. Um, and there was a huge project to build a gas transmission system um, and convert gas appliances so that uh, they could use natural gas. Something like 40 million appliances, I think, converted over a 10 year period. Um, and along with natural gas, people started to use, um, uh, started to install central heating systems in their, in, their, in their homes. So there was a lot of widespread adoption of, of central heating. So I can remember going from the 70s, living in a house that was very cold. One room may have been heated with a cold fire. Um, and you know, you walked about the house with gloves on when it was very cold and coats and getting to bed without getting too cold was a challenge. And, and I, I can seriously remember waking up in the morning and it was warmer outside than inside, so we used to open the, the air window to let the warm air in. Um, so you can see that central heating was fantastic and it just transformed people's lives to be able to have the whole house being heated. Um, so that was a massive transformation um, to people's lifestyles. Um, and something like 80% of the population has now had their homes heated by gas with the central heating. Renewable, you can see just creeping in the top there. And when it comes to renewable, there's virtually nothing. Um, so looking at UK's energy consumption in 2012, um, you can see how large the heat sector is, nearly 50%. Um, with you know, transport and electricity, um, transport being the next largest. Um, this is an uh, excluded heat for electricity, it's only about 30% <coughs> of total um, heat consumption is through electricity. Um, but that heat is split into process heat, which is about just under a quarter. So this is, when I talk about process heat, I talk about high temperature, high pressure heat, using um, chemical industry, for example, petrochemical industry. Um, but three quarters of it is, is what I call low grade heat. So this is heat below about 100 degrees Celsius, mainly for space and, and water heating. Um, and over half of that is for domestic users. And CO2 emissions are about 130 million tonnes, something like that. So they're about a quarter of the total UK's carbon emissions. And if we're going to hit the 2050 targets, I think it's fairly clear that we have got to do something about, about heat. And in fact, um, when you look at some of the sectors which present more of a challenge in terms of decarbonisation, um, the only way we're going to hit our 2050 targets is to virtually fully decarbonise heat. And as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, most of heat, most of the heat comes from from gas, um, oil, and solid fuels. It's under 10 percent. So these mostly for people off off gas grid. Um, 10 percent electricity, a lot of storage heaters, and not much on the renewable side. And a tiny, weeny bit on CHP. So, um, in the 70s. Uh, a lot of European countries got really badly caught out by the oil crisis um, and French went ahead and built loads of nuclear power stations. We were okay because, because we had gas from the North Sea. Um, and the Danish group was to, to build district heat systems and to, uh, to look at converting their existing coal-fired power stations, oil-fired power stations to produce heat. So who knows about the CHP plant, combined heat and power plant? Oh, yeah, it's good. Okay. So this is where you produce heat as well as electricity. Um, and they're looking at a system to 2050 uh, where they come, come off fossil fuels completely. So there's still a lot of oil, a lot of coal being used um, with gas um, and renewables is growing very significantly. Um, but they're looking at a system which is predominantly wind-based uh, with solar waste and biomass. They have a caveat over biomass because they still have concerns like most people should have about biomass, about the true sustainability of biomass. Um, so quite an ambitious plan. Um, but really, well, this is a really interesting figure, I think, because um, if 
This shows the um, location of power plants um, in Denmark. Um, so this is 1985, and on the right, it's uh, 2009. So it's quite clear they've moved to a, a decentralized energy system in a fairly big way. And if we did a similar figure, looking at Great Britain, say in the 1970s, to where we are, it would be the other way around. So we'd show lots and lots of power stations in the 1970s, and relatively few power stations um, uh, today. So the so days of decentralized en uh, energy in a fairly big way, with electric heat systems, and we've moved in the opposite direction. I'm not quite sure that it's the right way to go. Um, they've got a nice pretty picture here showing their system with, uh, without fossil fuels, and the sort of things that they show here, um, so they've got a district's heating system here, they show these very large heat pumps, who's familiar with heat pumps? Who's heard about very, very large heat pumps? Tens of megawatts, so, so they're looking at very large heat pumps feeding hot water into or heating to district heating systems, got solar thermal, geothermal, large storage systems for hot water, um, together with the sort of stuff that um, solar PV, heat pumps, wind farms, wave power, you know, that's the sort of vision, I guess, that they're looking for. Um, but they've got a head start because they've got district heating systems. So here's some, some interesting pictures about uh, what well, I'm interested about digital heat system. The one thing, uh, this is, this is their, one of their CHP plants. I think it looks quite nice. I don't know what you think about it, but um, I guess if you're going to build a CHP station, and it needs to be fairly near uh, where people live, they'll probably need to pay some attention to the aesthetics. Um, this is an example of um, the sort of pipes that are used. There's some of them very big um, in big cities, and so obviously you need a flow and return for the hot water. Um, uh, this slide shows where Denmark is. Now Denmark's got a population just under 10 million, so it's not a particularly big country, but it's getting close to 60% with, with, uh, with uh, CHP um, as a portion of national power production. And we're way down here. Um, most of that is, is associated with process uh, CHP plant. Some more pictures, and um, I talked about heat storage. And who remembers the old gasometers? So, um, and so these these are great big tanks that we use to store town gas, which are manufactured from the from the coal from the gas um, town gas plants. Um, most of them being decommissioned now, um, but the sort of size tanks that are used for heat storage are, are similar to the size that we used to use for gasometers. So I do wonder whether we'll be rebuilding them, you know, perhaps in the future. Um, so these are examples of gasometers. And the great thing about heat is that it's incredibly cheap. Heat storage is very, very cheap. Whereas, as you may know, electricity is very, very expensive electricity storage. And the Danes are looking at, in fact, they're already doing it, where they're, they're dumping wind. So we've got lots and lots of wind on the system. Whereas a few years ago they were exporting it to Germany and Sweden and getting virtually nothing for it, now they're dumping it into these storage systems. So it's a good way of, of increasing the utilization of, of um, renewable energy. Um, so these are above ground storage, this is underground storage uh, system, so you've got natural um, insulation around the tank. What's the vector for that? For that? Store, what, 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 where the heat gets stored? I, sorry, the, I mean, what, what kind of heat is it? It's just hot water. Hot water. Yeah, hot water yes, yeah. So it's um, it's literally a big tank um, filled up with water. Huge tank filled up with water. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Sorry. It's all right. Um, one of the important things about heat is that it, it almost has to be local. It's very difficult to, it's not impossible, but very difficult to transport heat over very long distances. So it does introduce a sort of local mindset. So when people are looking at um, heat for, for an area, shall we say, then um, 
so one of the things that, that heat engineers would do would be to look at the natural features of that area. So for example, this, this is an example of underground storage at a Swedish airport. Um, so it's, it's a natural um, uh, geological um, feature where water can be stored. So during the, the winter, uh, warm water which has been stored during the summer is then used to provide heating and during the summer it's the other way around. Um, I believe that there is a natural um, reservoir under my college, Imperial College. Um, uh, don't know very much about it, but but uh, uh, so almost one of the first things that you need to do is to say what are the natural features of the area that we're looking at in terms of geological features, but also in terms of you know, is there industry, for example, which is wasting heat, which we can use to uh, to feed into the district heating system. Is there a power station, for example, that is using water to cool the power station and feeding it into the river? Are there rivers? Because if you've got a river, you've got a heat source, which you could use for things like large heat pumps, which I'll touch on a bit later on. Um, solar thermal, quite big in Denmark, um, but relatively cheap. Solar thermal is quite expensive to retrofit in this country. Um, it's not so bad if you're building a new house and you install it with solar thermal, but retrofitting can be quite expensive. It's very, very cheap if you build things like this. Um, biogas, um, I have question marks over whether it makes a lot of sense to, to use biogas for heating because it's a premium fuel we should be using for something else. But if you've got agriculture, farming, and so on, and you can reduce biogas, then you can use that to drive a, an engine of some kind and feed power and heat. Um, into the local system. Um, I mentioned about a large seawater source heat pump. So this is an installation in Stockholm. I think it's about 400 megawatts thermal. So um, it uses the, the harbour in, in Stockholm, which is essentially the Baltic Sea, as a heat source. Um, and that and feeds it directly into the into the Stockholm district heat system. So these are very large heat pumps. Um, and it's interesting. Yesterday, there was an article in the Independent um, talking about looking at renewable energy from rivers and lakes, which could replace gas in people's homes. So I have to say this is something because I have been talking to various people about the work I've been doing, and the the mindset a few years ago was that. You know, to have district heating systems, you have to have CHP plant. Um, and of course, that's not the case. There are lots of different, different sources for heat, one of which is, is um, very large heat pumps. And if you've got a river, if the town's on the coast, you've got sea, uh, or you've got lakes, then you've got a natural uh, heat source which you could then use to produce heat and to feed into your, your heating system. What's, so, and what sort of performance factors do the heat pumps get? Well, there's two things about large heat pumps which are, uh, are helpful. One is that they can operate uh, at produce heat at much higher temperatures. So one of the challenges that we face with residential heat pumps is the sort of refrigerant that, that's used, which has limitations on the, on the um, performance of the heat pump. And so it's difficult to get them to produce heat above 55 Celsius. So very large heat pumps can operate on on um, uh, CO2 or um, so, do you know, okay, Peter might be help me here. Um, what's the cleaning stuff? Ammonia, yeah, ammonia, ammonia heat pumps, yeah, that's it. I think of Ajax for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and, and they can operate up to about 90 Celsius. And you probably know your, your heating system in your home probably operates around about 70 Celsius. So they can operate at a much higher temperature. Um, and because you're, you're, you can operate several heat pumps, you can manage the, the number of heat pumps that you want to operate depending on the, on the load of the system. Whereas, so one heat pump in your house has to operate throughout the year, no matter what the demand is. With a large heat pump station, you can operate several heat pumps. So you can get performances, you know, about 350% COPs. Um, but you're producing heat at around about 90 Celsius.
So, um, let's go on to the UK's carbon plan. How, how many are familiar with the UK's carbon plan? Yeah, oh, goodness me. If I'd known you would be here, perhaps right now. <laughs> um, so, so this, this is a really important document. Uh, it came out at the end of 2011, um, and it covers the whole of the uh, energy requirements of the UK, and what are we going to do in terms of reducing our carbon so that we can hit the, the target. And um, so it, it's, it's got a lot of need, but it's got something of need. Um, and always the first thing you should look at is how do we reduce demand for energy, no matter what it is. What is it we can do to reduce demand? So that, that features reasonably prominently, as you would expect. Um, and then it moves on to decarbonising heating and cooling. Now cooling is, is relatively small um, compared to heat in the UK, but it is growing, uh, particularly on the commercial side. Um, but, you know, obviously heating in this country, as we might expect, um, uh, is pretty substantial. Um, so, some of the things about improving building heating efficiency, Green Deal, I'm not going to go on about that because people have different views about the effectiveness of Green Deal, uh, ECHO, building standards, these are the sort of things that we can do to improve building heat efficiency. Um, improving the efficiency of lighting appliances, um, changing behaviour, which I mentioned a bit earlier on, you know, what is it we can do to, to help people? At the end of the day, it's people that, that consume heat. What is it we can do to um, help them use less heat? Um, energy controls, for example, in this country, I think they're absolutely appalling. You know, um, there's been some work done looking at the quality of controls in people's heating systems, and they're dire. You know, in many cases, they don't work at all. Um, where they do work, you may have one thermostat controlling heating in the whole house. Um, uh, thermostat bells or radiators, you know, if they're fitted quite often they don't work. Um, and so, you know, we clearly need to think about controlling heat in a much better way. I've just moved into a new house. Um, I can't say I bought the house because it had underfloor heating, five heating zones, but it's absolutely great, you know, and um, uh, uh, and, and I'm quite sure that I am managing my heat consumption a lot better. So zoning of heating systems, so you don't have the living room coming on, the heating coming on in the morning, but only when you need it, you know, must have a beneficial impact on total um, uh, heat, heat consumption. Nest is, has just been taken over by Google, as you may know. Um, clearly Google has got aspirations in this area, and um, be interested to see what they come up with. But the, the Nest thermostat, because one of the problems with heating controls is that it's difficult to know how to work with it. Um, and you know, probably you need to get the instruction manual out and play around with it, you know, and end up giving up, just say, oh, I just need heating on. But Nest is, a, is one of these ones which is very intuitive in the way you use the control, um, and uh, it has a learning type feature associated with it. Um, uh, and I think that having a, a, a design which is meant for customers, so as opposed to a plumber who selects your heating control, um, would make a lot more sense. Um, some of the, the, the technologies which I've spoken about, biomass boilers, electric resistance heating, which is really storage heaters. Who's familiar with storage heaters? So most people when I talk about storage heaters say, you've got to be absolutely out of your mind. You know, these are horrible things. Um, you know, uh, I can remember we had storage heaters when I was young, and they were great big things like this, filled with bricks. Um, they heated low-cost electricity overnight. In the morning, it was absolutely wonderful. By the evening, it was freezing cold. So, and that's most people's memories of storage heaters. But they are a lot better than that nowadays. You can you can control the heat a lot better from storage heaters. Uh, and I, I think they may have a, uh, may have a future. Heat pumps, air source and ground source heat pumps, um, seen, I think, um, as being the solution to low carbon heat a few years ago. The idea was that you take your gas boiler out, buy your air source heat pump for Wix or BMQ or things like that, plug it in, and that be it. Um, but people have begun to realise it's not as simple as that. And there's all sorts of issues associated with, with heat pumps that we need to think about. Um, micro CHP, solar thermal hot water, um, and then onto network technologies, 
um, uh, then they start talking about combined heating power feeding into district systems, the district systems, gas grid biomethane injections, so you're decarbonizing the gas by injecting biomethane, um, and then heat networks themselves. So, um, so if you look at the document, there's a plan with some milestones which um, some might struggle to believe are achievable, but at least it's there and it's talking about the various things that need to be done. So it can be very simple about it. I think it's pretty good to have something like that, but it just needs to be taken very seriously. Um, the 2050 Pathways Analysis Report is another report which came out in 2010. Who, who's familiar with that? Anybody familiar with it at all? I have to say, I think it's very good. Uh, um, uh, and the, the reason why, I, I mean, I think it's very easy to, to look back and say there's a lot of stuff in there which I don't agree with, but at least it came up with something which um, uh, came up with a number of scenarios for the different pathways to 2015 and looked at all the various sectors um, and, you know, put some thinking down on a piece of paper. Um, and, uh, and, I, and, I, and I still refer to it, other people I think refer to it, it's become a basis upon, I think, you know, uh, uh, upon which people can make some analysis um, and, uh, and people know the reference point that people are working, working to. So, um, and, and it goes into, into a reasonable amount of detail in different sectors. So if you look at domestic heat demand, for example, then it, it looks at these sort of things, you know, people's, people's the internal temperature that, that, um, that people set their thermostats in their homes has risen over the last few years. So we're up to about, not far off 20 Celsius, and um, is, that continue, is that going to continue going up as people want more and more comfort levels? You know, what is the potential improvements from thermal efficiency, insulation, etc.? new housing developers, refurbishment into existing households, and so on. Um, it touches on domestic hot water, and um, I, I think domestic hot water is, is a huge issue because there's almost nothing you can do about it, because the only thing you can do about it is to tell people not to wash so much. And I don't think that'd be very popular, but people like to have showers, people, more and more people are having showers, people like power showers. Um, and. Um, and they waste a lot of, you know, something like 10 litres a minute, I think it's something like that. It's a huge volume of water that is used for. I think by 2050, we could be looking at using more heat for hot water as domestic customers than we do for, for electricity in total. That's the scale of the amount of um, heat which is used for hot water. So it's, it's something which needs to be looked at. Um, uh, it's interesting that I've come across what are recycling showers. Anybody heard of recycling showers? No, so this is, this is a shower. It sounds disgusting, but, but the, the waste water is filtered and cleaned and circulated back up again. Um, and uh, it's an Australian product, which um, uh, looks quite interesting. But there may be social issues that, we, <laughs> that may be challenging. But, so there are ideas out there. Um, uh, and then just running through, um, it then comes up with these different pathways, looking at electric electrification levels for heating technology, um, you know, what percentage will be electrified and what percentage will be heated from other low carbon sources, um, uh, as well as the, yes, the, well the non-electric heating fuel scenarios. So, um, and then it comes up with these pathways, um, and these pathways include uh, an increase in households from roughly 27 million today to 40 million households by 2050. And so the blue line is um, doing something but not very much. So most of that increase comes from the, from the increase in households. So this is a terrible thousand of brand, so we're just above 300 today for domestic customers. Um, level three is probably seen as the sort of reference position Whereas level, level four is a fairly aggressive um, energy efficiency type uh, scenario. Um, so, um, 
So four pathways that we can look at, and there are similar pathways used in the other, uh, the other sectors. And I've used those, I'll come back to them a bit later on. And then there's a number of different electri electrification levels for heating technology pathways, as well as the non-electric fuels. And then you come up with, they've got 14 pathways altogether. Um, but it's just useful to have a look at these and just see what this actually means in terms of um, electricity, biomass, power station heat, for example, um, from the different scenarios of, of, of different pathways that come out of the thinking behind uh, uh, each of those. 2015 pathways calculator, who's, who's familiar with that? Yeah? I mean, it's, it's, it's great for fun, isn't it? But um, I think there should be something on here which says, don't take this too seriously. Because you know, it's, it's a useful learning tool because it just helps us feel what the impact of, is of different decisions. Um, so it's great. But I do come across people that uh, take it quite seriously and, and you've got to be very careful. But it's, if you haven't played with it, have a go. And you've got lots of pretty grass that come out of it as well. And then last year, um, uh, as anybody on the heat side will know, um, heat has been referred to as um, is it the Cinderella of the energy sector. You know, it's, it's people who focus on electricity, on transport, but not really bothered about heat. But in the last two or three years, there's been growing interest in heat. And this is the second document that came out from DEC uh, looking at the future of heating. Um, and it's, it's been interesting that heat networks that were barely mentioned a few years ago have grown in prominence um, and uh, DEC have set up what's called a heat networks delivery unit specifically there to support um, uh, or provide funding for feasibility projects for heat systems. Um, Low carbon heating industry is taken quite seriously for once. Quite often, it's one of the areas that's been neglected. Um, uh, but that's, that's been given more prominence in this document. Um, but one of the key areas is looking at waste heat recovery. And, and in London, there's been a fairly major study looking at the amount of wasted heat. I always, I always prefer to call it wasted heat as opposed to waste heat. There's nothing wrong with it, it's just been wasted. And, um, and that can be used and fed into, into, uh, into a heat network, if you have a heat network. And so a lot of heat is produced by substations, for example. The underground system produces a lot of heat. Um, so there was a survey done by I think the Bureau of Hapold um, to look at how much potential heat is there in London. And I think in theory it could meet half of London's heating needs. Um, but another very important area is actually developing the skills are needed because essentially the core heating skills in this country is focused around gas. And if we're going to look at other sorts of, of heating systems, whether it's heat pumps or digital heating, you know, we need to get these skills developed. Um, and it does re refer to the strategic questions facing the gas network because, as I mentioned earlier, if we're going to decarbonize heat, we've got to stop using gas. And we've got a massive investment in gas transmission and gas distribution systems, and everything else associated with it. So what are we going to do with that? Um, and uh, I mean, it's, it's on the timetable, but there's very little work going on in that area. And it was one of the things that were picked up by the UKIRK um, gas work <coughs> last year in March, I think it was, wasn't it? And, uh, and one of the recommendations was that we need to start thinking about what do we do with the gas system? <coughs> So I'm going to move on to the work that I've been doing uh, in my research, <coughs> which is primarily focused on the large-scale decarbonisation of heat in the UK. So I'm looking at it from a national system perspective. Um, if we're going to go down the heat pump route, what does this mean for our electricity infrastructure in terms of generation, transmission, distribution networks, or if you're going to go down the district heat route, what is that going to mean? Um, and other solutions as well. So it is, it's mainly a top-down 
approach which I'm adopting as opposed to looking at much smaller systems. And <clears throat> the first challenge that I came across <clears throat> was to understand what heat demand was. <clears throat> because with electricity you can go onto the National Grid website and you can download half hourly electricity demand for the last 20 years, just like that. There's not that data available for heat demand. In fact, the only data you can really get is annual total heat demand. <coughs> split between sectors. And if you look at electrifying heat, you need it in far more definition. You need half hourly, preferably certainly hourly heat um, demand. <coughs> Excuse me. And of course we haven't got that data. Um, and if you're looking at the impact on infrastructure, how much capacity do you need, what is the impact on the electricity system, etc., etc., um, you've got to get that data from somewhere. Um, now, one approach used by my colleague was to, to model the, the buildings, to design a heat model which looks at the energy losses in the building, um, to look at what the heat demand might be for that building. Um, but, you know, with 30 million nearly in this country, you know, that would have been quite a challenge. And even if you could do that, um, what you cannot capture is the human behavior aspects of it. How people use their heating system, um, you know, uh, when the heating comes on, when it comes off, etc., etc. Um, so I got a different approach, which I'm just going to run through and just give you an overview of, of the methodology that I, I, I used. Um, so essentially what I was trying to do was to synthesize a half hourly demand from the only data that we did have available. So, um, so this, this is just a quick reminder of what the heat was in 2012. I'll just skip that and move on to... So what I did was to look at um, gas consumption because nearly 80% of heat comes from gas and we can, I could access daily gas demands. This is daily gas demand not half hour of gas demand. Um, so that data was available. Um, and one of the key things about heat is that, as you might expect, that it's affected by temperature. And there's a fairly strong relationship, as you might expect, between uh, temperature and gas consumption. And this shows a plot for the last 10 years of, um, of daily gas consumption against temperature. Um, and so this is gas in terawatt hours per day, and this is temperature, uh, air temperature, and there's a cutoff point here which tends to be when people turn their heating systems off, and so the only real heat consumption above that level is mainly associated with hot water heating. So that allowed me to construct this sort of model, which said, well, if I if I understand how temperature affects demand. Um, uh, I've got data in terms of gas consumption, so I can build this sort of this sort of relationship. Um, if I've got the profile of heat, I can then break the daily consumption down into a half hour uh, pattern to break my half annual, half hourly annual heat demand. So um, I'll come on to the half hourly model in a moment, but this is a figure which shows. It's a temperature duration curve. It's upside down, so this is negative, this is very cold, this is not so cold. Um, and the red line represents the coldest year um, over the last 10 years, which was 2010. You know, the temperatures dropped to minus 7 on average over, over, uh, over England. Central England temperatures, these are. Um, whereas the blue and the green are sort of mild or normal, uh, normal temperatures. The reason why this is important is because, um, as I mentioned earlier, temperature has a huge influence on, on heat consumption, far less when it comes to electricity. And so having temperature scenarios are pretty, very important. But quite often what people use, they use what they call a seasonal normal temperature, which is a sort of average type profile. And the problem with that is that you miss these peaks. So quite, sometimes they compensate by saying, well, we'll use that and then I'll take a very cold day. And, and, uh, but the problem is that you miss this bit here as well. So, um, sorry, did you um, 
because there's a community quite a big difference between Cornwall, that what I like to be Cornwall, what I like to work in Northern Scotland. Mm. And did you take that into account when you were on? No. Yeah. But that'd be another thing to look at. But you could do that. Yeah. You, you could break this down into into because the data which you can get, the cast demand data, uh, is um, available on a regional basis, and so is temperature data as well. So you could do this on a regional basis. Um, so I'll just get on to the next slide. So, um, so I've got all this data. I know how heat consumption is affected by temperature, but what I don't know is how people use it on a half hour by half hour basis. The only data I could get access to was data done by the Carbon Trust for their the micro CHP trial back in 2005, 2007, where they um, instrumented um, around about 80 homes altogether um, to measure heat consumption on a five minute by five minute basis. So massive data associated with it. Um, so this was the only data I could get access to which showed how people use heat um, during the day and the pattern of consumption. Um, so, and there were two types of heating systems used. One was a micro CHP unit, which had a heat output of about 12 kilowatts, which is similar in size to what you'd use for a, for a heat pump, for example. Um, so this is heat in kilowatt thermal. This is time during the day. Um, the blue line is um, the average over the week. And I've broken it down into the red line, which shows weekday and the green weekend. So you can see people get happen a bit later at the weekend. You know, I guess we all do that. Um, and then I show the maximum for the, for the, for the site as well. Um, so that gave me a profile of heat consumption for micro CHP sites. Um, and as you might expect for a condensing boiler, the heat output can be 25 or 30 kilowatts, so two or three times that of a micro CHP. It's much peakier. So essentially people's heating comes on for a shorter period of time, but when it's, when it's on, the heat output is much higher. Um, so different profiles. And it was these half hourly profiles that I then used to profile the, um, uh, to, to, to synthesize the national half hourly demand profile. So, um, oh, sorry, there's domestic hot water as well, which is pretty flat. Um, uh, the, the data didn't just cover micro CHP condensing boiler, it was also broken down to housing types, age of house, construction of house, um, terrace, in the terrace, detached houses. Unfortunately, the sample size wasn't particularly big. Um, so I had a little bit, little bit careful in terms of not trying to, uh, uh, with such a small sample size, um, Word. Extrapolate things which, 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 which may not be true. Um, and but one of the most one of the most interesting things that came out of this analysis was what's called the peak coincidence factor. Anybody heard of the peak coincidence factor? No, I hadn't until I, I did this research. But um, so the peak coincidence factor is used by electrical distribution engineers. Um, and it's very important because um, a distribution circuit feeding houses, for example, um, if you rented the, the cable to meet the peak demand or the rating of all the connections to people's homes, it would be vastly oversized. So typically your, your house, your connection to your house will be about 20 kilowatts. And typically there will be 200 homes connected on, that, on the same circuit. And so 200 times 20 is uh, 4 megawatts, I think. So if you, if you did not take into account diversity, you'd have to put a 4 megawatt supply um, circuit in place to feed those 200 homes. The distribution engineers know that diversity is very significant, and they can actually derate the main cable by 95%. So, um, so on average, the, the consumption is 1 kilowatt per home. Um, so this plot here is the daily peak coincidence factor against the temperature. And so for, for pure electricity, electricity only, non-heating load, 
is around about 5%. But when you add heating though, because people's heaters are on for longer periods of time, there's a greater chance that their heating will coincide with other people's heating systems. And as you might expect, when it gets colder and colder, your heating comes on for a longer period of time. And so the coincidence factor drops from 5% really down to 50%. And so this has a huge impact on the rating required for the distribution circuit. And so even though you've got a 20 kilowatt um, uh, connection, and even though your heat pump may only take two or three kilowatts, um, you will have to reinforce the electricity network uh, to supply heat pumps which are connected to, to a distribution circuit. And that could be a reinforcement of at least double, possibly three times, if we're looking at wide scale clustering of heat pumps onto, onto heat network. So, um, so that's pretty important because, because it, it revealed to me that it was almost unavoidable that you would need to significantly reinforce distribution circuits uh, if you're looking at wide scale deployment of heat pumps. Robert, are you taking a fair and consider the sort of spatial impacts of this? Because obviously there's a coincidence factor in terms of where they're located on the networks as well. Yeah. So in Cornwall, for example, there's a lot of off gas grid. Mm. So you expect the economics to favour the, the um, Heating the, 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 sorry, the heat pumps mm. because the economics would be because obviously gas costs, yeah. you know, oh, sorry, that oil would be twice as expensive yeah. as gas heating. Mm. So, have you thought about taking this further and doing some sort of assessment based on, on that in terms of the impact and the spatial impacts? Well, um, instance, others are doing work. I mean, there's, there's, there's an off gen working group looking at this, but I know that within, within Imperial, uh, one of the things that they've identified working with people like UK Power Networks is that it does vary significantly, with some distribution circuits um, have, are significantly overrated. So they can avoid significant, significant reinforcement. Others are pretty tight. So it does vary very significantly. So uh, um, uh, I think the key point is that, is that because they all vary, um, uh, that you've got to look at each case individually to see what, what the potential impact might be. So, your example, then, you know, when you're looking at, come back to my point about heat being a local issue, when you look at potential solutions, you've got to look at what are the specific issues associated with reinforcing electricity network, gas systems, or whatever, putting in a heat system, what the potential repercussions might, might be. So there's not, then there's a general rule which, which you can apply. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, no, no, I do think it's this area and it needs to work. So. Yes, definitely. But I think the main point I was trying to make is, is don't assume you just plug in an air source heat pump and everything will be out the door. Um, so this, this figure here, I sort of produced it a few a couple of years ago, and then people kept asking me if they could copy it, and so it appeared all over the place. You know, and I sort of realized I made a big mistake, I should have charged people a pound or something like that. So, um, but I guess the, the power from this diagram of this figure is, is that it, it helped people conceptualise the challenge presented by heating. Because electricity demand peaks around about 60 gigawatts, it's down here, whereas heat is getting close to 300 gigawatts. So there's, there's, a, there's a massive, massive challenge. And it's not just the peak of heat, it's the load factor heat as well. So, Typically, electricity load factor is around about 60% for domestic customers. Um, whereas for, are people familiar with load factor? Yes, good. Um, whereas for heat, it's around about 20%. So, um, and, I, and I think you can sort of visualize, you know, uh, so there's a huge swing between, between um, summer and winter, but also between one day and another day. And it's one of the huge challenges the gas system faces. And they talk about gas swing. But in the gas system, they've got massive storage, um, either natural storage in the, in the, in the, in the transmission system itself. So it's quite common that they will pump up the system at night to cope with the peak demand during the day. And obviously, with electricity, you can't do that. Um, so then I 
coming back to the pathways I spoke about a bit earlier on, so what does this mean in terms of 2050 pathways for UK peak heat demand? So if you remember the pathway one, where we don't do very much, most of the increase in, in, uh, in heat consumption is due to increase in households. So we're going well above 400 gigawatts thermal, thermal peak, um, whereas pathway four is, is, is much, much less. So huge uncertainty in terms of, of what UK's peak heat demand might be. Um, I was also able to look at it from an electricity peak demand point of view. So let me take you through these figures, because um, there's, there's a lot of information on here. So if I take pathway one, on this axis we've got peak heat demand gigawatts. So this is peak electricity heat demand only. And that's the black line. And the green line is the percentage of electrification. So if you look at, so we've got by 2050, I'm assuming that 50% of heat will be electrified. So if that is the case, then the peak, electricity peak heat demand will be 70 gigawatts. So more than double um, the peak, today's peak electricity. But the blue line shows the variation due to weather. Um, and that's huge, so it could be as high as 90 gigawatts. So, you know, we're talking about increasing peak capacity by 150%. I just need to, I can't quite see this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good to... So, um, again, all I was trying to illustrate with this is, is the potential impact on the electricity system from electrification of heat. So even with modest level of electrification, there's a huge impact on, on, on the system from, from, from electrifying heat. And you know, weather has a huge impact as well. So do you, do you design a system for cold weather, um, it, you know, which adds another 20 gigawatts, or do you go for normal? Um, how do you actually manage that uncertainty? Um, obviously, demand side management is a potential option. You know, will people be prepared to manage their heat demand when it's extremely cold, um, or will they do the opposite? That's plugging lots more heaters because uh, you know, to make the situation even worse. So, um, so I don't need to read all these words. I mean, the main point I'm trying to bring out is is that um, uh, I guess this, this is. This is a starting point to try to understand the potential impact on um, moving away from a gas-based system to whether it's electricity or heat. Um, and the impact is going to be very significant. We had to do something, so we had to come up with some, some way of quantifying what the impact would be through the, the, uh, the model which I constructed. Um, there are lots of scope for improvement. As we get better data, I can see the model being improved. But as a starting point, I think it's been very helpful to actually quantify the potential impact. The point about the peak coincidence factor is really important. Um, and, um, and, and the data I showed you there, where it rose to sort of 50%, that was a fairly mild winter as well. Um, unfortunately, it didn't have cold winter data, but it, it's not really possible that will continue to go even higher. Um, there's a whole issue about how do you size a heat pump. Um, because um, the recommended approach is that you size it to meet 90% or so of, of heat demand um, because you're more likely to have a more efficient operation of the heat pump than if you size it for you know, the peak heat demand, which may only care, occur for a few days in the year. In fact, it wouldn't occur at all this year because it, wasn't that, it hasn't been that cold this year. Um, and the problem with that is that it runs less efficiently most of the time. Um, so, uh, so there's challenges there which I'll come back to a little bit later on. Um, heating does offer potential for demand-side participation, but when you look at heat pumps, the only way you can, you can really use demand-side participation is if you've got storage. And probably you need a lot of storage for it to be effective. Um, Manufacturers will typically recommend something like 200 litres 
story. So it's about double the normal hot water tank size. And bearing in mind, a lot of people are removing their hot water tanks using combination boilers because they want the space. The prospects for putting in something that's twice the size is um, may present challenges. And, um, and I think for efficient demand side management, you probably need something like 500 litres. It's a huge increase in the size of, of, of water storage. Um, per household? Per household, yeah. So, um, and if you're living in London, you're paying £1,500 a square metre or something like that, you know, to, to allow your water to be, you know, used by a hot water tank is probably not to too attractive to people. Um, my final point is the sensitivity to temperature from heat demand. As I said, electricity is relatively insensitive to demand at present. Okay, um, so what I'm now going to move on to is um, trying to explore some of the economic aspects of these systems. Um, and all I'm trying to do here is try and illustrate some of the, some of the costs which frequently get ignored when people do this sort of analysis. So often when I look at analysis which have been done by various people, they look at one part of the process. So it could be the impact on the transmission system or the um, generation capacity. Um, and very rarely do people look at it from beginning to end. In fact, I was looking at the Scottish heat strategy document, which came out a few weeks ago, um, which is similar to the heat strategy document that DEP produced last year. Um, and, and so they're looking at various options, heat pumps, additional heating, and they specifically say they have not taken account of the impact on generation capacity that would be needed from heat pumps. You know, and if you don't take account of that, you know, you're not going to get the right answer. So, um, so, so, uh, and that's what I, I, I've done in this in this analysis. Um, this analysis is pretty high level. My present work is to do much more detailed analysis of the overall economics of, of these systems. Um, and I express the parameters on a sort of household per annum basis. So I've tried to get down to a, so they give you a big millions of pounds per annum figure. Uh, I'm using a pound per household per annum figure. So, um, so you, you all know about CHP plant, don't you? <laughs> so, um, okay, so, so one thing about CHP, which, so I'll tell you about CHP just in case, just to remind myself, I guess. But a typical combined cycle plant has a, a gas turbine, the exhaust heat is fed into a heat recovery boiler, um, and, and steam is raised to drive steam turbines, so that's a combined cycle plant. Um, a CHP plant takes heat, bleeds heat off the steam turbine, and that's fed into a district heating system. And, um, but one of the consequences of taking energy out of the steam turbine is that the electricity output will drop as a consequence of that. Um, I always get wound up when people say, oh, we waste so much heat, because I don't think it's really true. We don't really waste heat, because the heat that comes out of a normal power station is around about 30, 35 Celsius. There's not much we can do with it. You know, it's almost tepid water, so we're not really wasting heat. Um, a, CH, a CHP system is taking heat around about 1900 Celsius, something like that on average. It's a sort of temperature which has been the, 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 uh, the heat that's been taken away from the steam turbine. Um, so you're losing electrical output. But the key thing about it is that um, for every one unit of electricity output you lose, you're gaining five, six, seven units of heat. So, um, so from that point of view, um, it's a bit like a heat pump in reverse. So you know that with a heat pump, you put one unit of electricity in, you'll get three units of heat out, for example. With a CHP unit, you, put, you lose one unit of electricity, you'll get five, six, seven units of heat out. So it's pretty good in terms of producing heat. Um, and that's why you can look at combined cycle plant, CHP plant, 
but efficiency is approaching 90%. Um, uh, so, and there's, who's heard of exergy? Have you heard of exergy? So I don't really understand exergy, to be frank, but I mean, the, the way I think of it is that exergy sort of quantifies the quality of energy. Um, and one of the issues that we have to, with heat is that we, we actually only read, really need low quality heat. Yet most of our systems produce very, very high quality heat. So your gas boiler burns gas at 700 degrees Celsius. You don't need heat at 700 degrees Celsius. You need heat at, to heat your room at 20 degrees Celsius. So from an exergy point of view, that's very, very inefficient. Um, but with a combined cycle CHP uh, uh, process, you can produce heat at very, very high temperatures. You use that heat to produce, produce electricity, which is um, uh, very high quality energy. Um, and then when the quality of the energy falls to a level which is then useful for district heating, um, you're using it, so from an exergy, exergy point of view, you're, you're using it much more efficiently. So, um, but as I said, I don't really understand exergy. But, but, <laughs> but process engineers will use that to refine their, their processes by maximizing the, the exergy efficiency of, the, of their systems. So, um, you're familiar with heat pumps. So a heat pump is, the way I describe it in simple terms, is like a refrigerator. So you know your refrigerator takes heat out the inside of the refrigerator and, and you fill the back of the refrigerator and you fill the heat coming out the back of the refrigerator. Um, but the key thing about a heat pump is that its performance um, varies with, with, with two key factors. Um, so quite often heat people talk about heat pump, they say, oh, it's 300% efficient. Um, and they should always quote when it's 300% efficient. So the two key, two, two key factors are air temperature and water flow temperature in, in the home. So, um, so yes, you can get 300, 350% uh, efficiencies if the water flow temperature is around about 35 Celsius in the home, and the air temperature is around about 7 degrees Celsius. But if it's colder, or if you need a higher flow temperature because you're under floor heating, then the performance of the heat pump is, is much, much worse. So what I've shown here, this is based on a um, Mitsubishi Ekodan um, heat pump. So, I'm assuming 55 degree water flow temperature. And I've got my three temperature scenarios. The red one is the very cold one, the black one is the seasonal normal, um, and the blue green are the mild and the, and the normal. But you can see that under very cold conditions, the COP is nearly getting down to 150% efficiency. So, you know, you may get 300% under good conditions, but when you really need it, it won't be so good. Um, and what really happens with that is that, um, let's just say you, you had a 12 kilowatt heat pump um, under normal conditions, then the electrical input, let's just say, is 4 kilowatts, so it's 300% efficient. Um, when it gets very cold, from an electrical point of view, it's still taking 4 kilowatts, but the COP means it's only pushing out six, seven kilowatts of heat. Um, and when it's very cold, your house, which needs 12 kilowatts under normal conditions, probably needs 15 kilowatts under cold conditions. So, you know, um, uh, it's really, really important you understand this relationship between temperature and your building needs. Um, because from a customer point of view, um, when you're worried about the impact of the electricity system for all your heat pumps, if they get very cold, they're probably going to plug in their fan heaters and their convector heaters, which are 100% efficient, so they're even worse. So you know, this, is, this is a major challenge which people need to think about. So I'm sorry to labor that point, but it's a really important point to emphasize. Is that, is that clear to everyone? Um, so this is so what I've done here is, is to say, well, um, 
And let's try and understand some of these costs associated with um, decarbonizing heat. Well, I'm going to use two examples, and I'm a strong believer in what I call a transition scenario. So not one big step to 2050, but looking at how we move in, in manageable steps to, to decarbonizing heat, which probably means that there's a much longer term role for gas uh, um, that would be ideal, perhaps. So the example we use here is, is a system which is predominantly nuclear and some biocycle plant, and gas is still provided for heating purposes. <laughs> um, the example, case 1B on the right, shows um, a heat network with a minor heat of power, a biocycle plant, a large heat pump, some storage, um, and just you know, the normal electricity for people's um, electricity needs. So, I'm not going to go into this in massive detail, but, um, but these are all the costs associated with, with those options. So, the bottom one is the power station itself. So, as you might expect, nuclear power stations are quite expensive. Um, the gas power station, even the CHP one, is not too expensive. It's about an extra 5 or 10%, well, probably about 5% more than just basic combined cycle plant. Um, we've got the gas boiler. Um, here you've got the digital heat network, a very big cost component. So overall, um, the cost of a digital heat-based system is more than my example with nuclear and gas, today's gas system. And that's not surprising because gas is, is pretty cheap. Gas appliances are quite cheap. But if you then move to a system where the heat is fully decarbonized, so with my all electric one, um, we're looking at heat pumps in people's homes, um, like a mixture of nuclear with CCGTs with carbon sequestration, and on the right, a district heat system with some nuclear, um, but essentially a fully decarbonized system, as, as in the case of, of, of the nuclear one. Um, and, and you can see that there's a very significant cost reduction, or uh, lower cost associated with the district heat system. And the reason why that is is because, as you might expect, nuclear is very expensive. Um, heat pumps are very expensive as well. So, from a, if you're connected to a district heat system, probably the only cost which is specific to the household is the connection from the road to your building, and possibly what's called a heating based unit, which might be a thousand, two thousand pounds. Whereas, if you put a heat pump in, you're probably talking about an all-in cost of five to seven thousand pounds, at least, I would guess. So there's a very big, big cost which needs to be included. Um, there's still the heat network cost. Um, uh, I've also got reinforcement cost for electricity system in there. But, but the main point I want to bring out is that when you include all the costs, generation capacity, network, plus your appliances in the home, then you get a different answer to, to the sort of figures that are seen produced by other people who introduce a caveat to say, I haven't, I haven't considered this bit over here. Is that, is that clear the point I'm going to make? And I've repeated this for the pathways, and it's pretty robust across the pathways as well. That when you look at the, the 2050 scenario, um, the different heat systems is in better in all cases. Um, so, okay, it's just a couple of points I've just made in actual fact. Um, so, I mean, just, just to summarise, um, because I made very, very clear, we are going to have to fully decarbonise heat if we're serious about hitting our 2050 target. Um, I mean, it's so, a word used all the time, but it is a transformation of, of the UK's heat sector. Um, and I emphasise infrastructure, in particular networks. We're going to move, rather than re reinforce the electricity network, or install a digital heating system um, to decarbonize heat. Um, 
in the energy sector, we're always guilty of the, you know, the so-called silk bullet, or this is the answer to everything, you know. Um, and that's definitely not the case with heat either. And it's really important that we adopt a whole systems approach. The word whole, the words whole systems are, are overused. People refer to it all the time, but they don't adopt a whole system approach. And I think that's, that's pretty important. Um, the real quick thing I think is that um, storage is very cheap. Uh, and that, that helps enormously with capacity because um, electricity capacity is very expensive. Um, but you can half the capacity needs with heat through storage, which is very cheap. So in terms of typically when you're designing a digital heat system, if the peak demand is 100 gigawatts, sorry, 100, 100 megawatts thermal, 50 can come from wood storage, which is very cheap, 50 can come from the CHP system. But it also provides enormous scope for supporting intermittent and inflexible generation. So intermittent wind, inflexible nuclear. Um, there's some initial studies that, that I've been doing shows that you know it can help a huge amount. Um, and my last point, this, this whole point about consumer engagement, which is so crucial um, when we're looking at heat, particularly when it comes down to people making decisions about how they're going to heat their homes. So.